Well, good morning, and what a beautiful morning it is. Hello there, Mr. Justin. It's always good to see you ready to worship. Let's stand and join our hearts together as we worship together.
Just a moment. We sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul, echoing the words of the psalmist. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in with, within me. Bless his holy name. But how do we bless the Lord? We can certainly see how he has blessed us. But how do we bless the Lord? It seems like we, we tend to think of it more the other way around, God blessing us. I did a little research into this word, this Hebrew word for blessed or blessed, and it's, it's one of the commentaries presented this way. The primary factor of blessing is a statement of relationship between parties. God blesses with a benefit on the basis of relationship. Of course, we hear the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Relationship. God is all about relationship. And his blessings to us are all about growing in that relationship. In the good times, and the times where we can just look around and see his hand of blessing on our life. But in the times of struggle as well, in the times of trials, when we pray and we don't seem to be getting the answer that we thought or that we wanted, we still thank him and praise him and come with an attitude of thanksgiving, realizing that as this song says, sometimes the blessings do come through those trials. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. 
comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while you hear each spoken need, yet love us way too much to give us lesser things. What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights? What it takes to know your need? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love. As if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea. Yet long that we'd have faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights? What it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? Friends betray us when darkness seems to win. We know the pain reminds this heart that this is not, this is not our home. so much, Paul. In 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul reminds us to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in, not for, in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In all circumstances, we can choose 
to be thankful. Let's watch this video together. Though I wake to a world with more questions than answers, where dissonant voices ignite division, my heart will stand firm in this decision. I choose thankful. Though I walk through a landscape that is uncharted and foreign, where the once familiar seems lost and forgotten, I will remember that nothing is unexpected to my Father in heaven, and I choose thankful. Though I live each day uncertain of tomorrow, I will accept that tomorrow was never certain and cherish every chance to witness the wonder of creation. I choose thankful. I choose faith in what is unseen, hope for a future beyond the adversity, love spoken despite animosity. I choose to believe. And though the struggles I face may be painful, though it sometimes seems impossible, though I fall a thousand times covered in the dust of failure, I am able to rise. Not because I am strong, not because life is perfect, but because in all circumstances, Jesus lives. When this world stands perplexed and demands I give a reason for the hope that I have, I can only say that in Jesus' name, I choose thankful. It's not a simple choice. It's not an easy choice, but it is the only choice that brings calm in the storm. Not by my power, but through the strength of Christ alone. I choose thankful. What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stand and worship. Sunset's glory, amazing artistry across the evening sky. When I feel the mystery of a distant galaxy, it falls and humbles me to be loved. I have got so.
seated. Kids are heading on back to kids worship. Good morning everybody. Happy Thanksgiving early. Hope you have a great week as you prepare to either be in town or on the road visiting with family or having them come to your house. I, I hope you have a good busy time together and give the Lord the praise that he deserves. 
If you were here last Sunday, able to be here last Sunday, then you heard me finish up my message with some scripture from Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to jump back there for just a minute. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. The writer, he wrote these words, uh, powerful words, uh, and, and I think they're going to help us answer some questions. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Without wavering, let us hold tightly to the hope that we say that we have. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. What promise is he talking about? I believe he's talking about the promise of eternal life. And he says in verse 24, Think of ways to encourage one another to outburst of love and good deeds. And let us not neglect our meeting together. As some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. You can see that the writer wrote these words with great expectation. What was he looking forward to? I think he was looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. And that's something we can look forward to even today. It's been a long time since these words were written, but the Lord's coming is certainly so much closer today than it's ever been. He was looking forward to the return of Christ. He was also looking forward to the rapture of the church where we will be eternally saved with the Lord forever and ever. Now, focus with me on verse 24. He says, think of ways to encourage one another to outburst of love and good deeds. I told you there were two ways you could do that. You could give somebody a good pat on the back or maybe a hug if you're comfortable with that at this point. Uh, that would encourage them. You can also say some kind and encouraging affirming words to them you can say something that will lift their spirits you can say something that will make them feel better about the situation that they're going through a lot of people need to be encouraged the last two years unfortunately um, have in so many ways scarred and depressed every one of us to some degree uh, i don't think any of us have been able to escape the demise and madness of the pandemic that we've been through. People are struggling, even as I speak. Discouragement is everywhere. It's at home. It's on the job. It's in the schools. Uh, it's on TV. You can see it and hear it just about everywhere you look. I said to you last week that everyone needs to be encouraged. Would you agree with me? Amen. And if you remember, I said encouragement is one of the most needed ministries in the church. We need to be an encouraging body of believers. Who doesn't need to be encouraged? I think we all do. I think Paul understood, understood discouragement as well as anyone could. He knew, he well knew, that the Christians in his day everywhere needed to be encouraged. And I can only imagine what Paul would be writing us today about our current situation, our, our world events, our uh, events here in America. I don't know what he would write, but I'm sure he would write something encouraging. He would try to lift our spirits and, and give us hope. When Paul wrote this letter, he was writing from a prison cell. And he was writing to people that he loved dearly, people uh, in the Roman province of Philippi. He knew that they were struggling, uh, much like we struggle today. And so he wanted to give them some hope and he wanted to give them some assurance that, that God was still working and that God could be counted on to bring to completion the wonderful work of deliverance that he began on the amazing day when he first uh, saved their soul, when they first believed and put their trust in Jesus Christ. These opening verses in Philippians 1 make up the essence of a thanksgiving prayer that that Paul lifted up to God, and he had so much to be thankful for as we do today. Even though Paul was behind bars, he was still thankful. You know, being, being locked up couldn't keep Paul quiet. It couldn't keep Paul from being busy for the Lord. He shared the gospel with anyone and everyone who would slow down just long enough for him to talk to them. Uh, he was just waiting. It was on the tip of his tongue. He also continued to pray, and he prayed fervently. And I want you to look with me at what Paul wrote in his letter about his prayer life. I think we get a hint of how he prayed. Philippians 1, verse 3. 
He said, every time that I think of you, I give thanks to my God. I always pray for you and I make my request with a heart full of joy because you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I'm sure that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus comes back again. Have you ever met somebody that you just couldn't get off your mind, that you couldn't forget about, somebody that you just thought about quite often? I think you have. I know I have. It may have, may have been that you only met that person one time, but you remember that encounter as if it were yesterday, and each time you do, you thank God that he crossed your paths with that particular person. Well, that was certainly the case with the Apostle Paul and with many of the people there at Philippi. He first met them on his second missionary journey. And if you remember, Paul was specifically directed by the Holy Spirit to go to a place called Macedonia, which was the province that Philippi was located in. Luke, Luke records in Acts chapter 16 these words, verse 7. He said, then coming to the borders of my, uh, of, of Mycenae, they headed for the province of Bithany, but again the Spirit of Jesus did not let them go. So instead, they went on to Mycenae to uh, from through Mycenae to the city of Troas. In verse nine, it says that night Paul had a vision, and he saw a man from Macedonia in the in northern Greece pleading with him, "Come over here and help us." And so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, for we could only conclude that God was calling us to preach the good news there. So they made their way, Paul and his team, they traveled to Philippi, and that first Sabbath in Philippi, they made their way outside the city of Philippi to the edge of a river, and, and they were hoping and expecting to find some Jewish worshipers uh, congregated together there. Um, there was no synagogue in Philippi because you had to have at least 10 Jewish males, 10 families to constitute a synagogue. So they didn't have that in the city. They must have heard that there was a group of people gathering to worship God outside the town. So when Paul and his mission team arrived at the river, the edge of the river, they, they found a small group of women who were having a prayer meeting. I, uh, I don't know for sure, but I can only imagine that one of the things these ladies were praying for was for God to send somebody there to help them with their faith, to help them to know God. And guess what? Paul was that someone. Paul was the answer to their prayers. And so God heard their prayers, and he sent Paul and his mission team there to help them. The Bible is very clear that when Paul thought about the church at Philippi, he thought about a particular woman who was most likely leading the prayer meeting that day. She was a Gentile proselyte of Judaism, which meant that she was a non-Jew who was seeking to know and to worship God. We would call her today a seeker, a, a, a God seeker, someone who was looking for God, evidence of God, an experience with God. The Bible tells us that her name was Lydia. Lydia. She was uh, an interesting lady. She became a major player in the church there in Philippi. She only knew God at this point with her head. There's a lot of people that know God with their head, but they only have facts. They don't have faith. She had not yet moved that facts or those inf that information from her head to her heart uh, like so many people she was yet to know God with her heart but at this point God was working on her heart and the beautiful thing is that her heart was open so God was using the Old Testament scripture that's all they had in that day he was also working uh, through the Holy Spirit and the preaching and the teaching of Paul and through those things God opened up Lydia's heart to receive Christ as Lord and Savior so she received the gospel truth of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, better still, she trusted Jesus to forgive her sin and to make things right between her and God. She was ready for God to put her and God together, and he used Paul to do that. And so the Bible says she was saved, and in the natural process of things, the spiritual things, once she was saved, she was then baptized. The Bible says that her whole household came to faith in Jesus Christ. So Lydia and her family literally became the very first Christian converts in Europe. It was all the way back that far. And they became the nucleus of that continent's first church. Think about that. I was sitting at my desk the other day and I couldn't help but wonder about how many children have received those Christmas uh, shoe boxes, those Christmas boxes, and Operation Christmas Child boxes, and, and how that many of them will be saved and most likely some of them will be the first person saved in their family, and maybe even the first person saved in their village, and that they may become the, the nucleus, the rallying pole around where the first church in that part, of the air, that part of the world would be constituted. I'm sure that's already happened, and I, I'm sure it's going to happen many times again. Every time Paul thought about the church at Philippi, he remembered Lydia and her family and and how they came to faith in Christ and how it was a bold faith. Uh, he remembered the demon-possessed girl that he was able to set free from that demon. He remembered the jailer and his family and how they had come to faith in Christ in the middle of the night. And they were so eager to be obedient to the Lord that they were literally baptized before the daybreak the next morning. And he remembered all of the people who, uh, all, who were believers there in that church and how that they were the only ones who who gave him help financially. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Paul writes, he says, As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I brought you the good news and I traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. And even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once for me. So Paul is saying, when I think of you, and I'm sure that their names, their faces, their image crossed his mind quite often. He said, when I think of you, I pray for you. I thank God for you. It, it's amazing here to me that, in fact, I think it's remarkable that given Paul's situation in prison, I mean, you know, you kind of get tunnel vision when you're in something like that. But he was, even though he was in prison, he's not thinking of himself. He's thinking of them. That's a sure sign of a true believer. He was a good and godly man. He was a true servant of the Lord. And, and as he was waiting for his trial and most likely his execution, Paul's mind continues to go back to his friends in Philippi. And his every recollection of them brings him great joy. Every time Paul thought of them, he, he not only um, thanked God, but he, he thanked God for some some specific things. He, he thanked God for their faithfulness in partnering with him and sharing the gospel with a lost and dying world. He, he thanked God for their amazing love for each other. He witnessed that. He experienced that. He thanked God for their spiritual steadfastness, for their generosity in sharing what they had in their hands and what they owned. And he thanked God for their spiritual growth and their joy that they had in the Lord and also for the joy that they brought him in his life and in his ministry. Chapter 4, verse 1 of Philippians. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, I love you and I long to see you, for you are my joy and the reward of my work. So please stay true to the Lord, my dear friends. We find that as he prayed, it says that he prayed asking God to provide for them what they needed and uh, to be able to do his precious will. Again, I'm, I'm amazed that given Paul's situation behind bars, that he's praying for other people and not just himself. He's not just praying, God, get me out of here. He's praying, Lord, take care of my brothers and sisters in Christ. His prayer life was not focused or based on me theology. He was a true servant of the Lord, and he put others' needs ahead of his own. It brought him joy to be able to pray for others. It, it's been said that an infallible test of godly joy is the degree to which a believer prays 
more earnestly for the benefit and the blessing of others than for his own. Paul wrote in Philippians 4, words of encouragement to us, instructive words. He says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. And remember, the Lord is coming soon. The Lord is coming. He said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. And if you do this, he said, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. What encouraging word. Notice verse 4. He said, when I pray, I make my requests for you, for all of you, with joy. Now, the context of that statement is centered around the work of God, the, the ministry that God gives us to do. He said, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ. Paul remembered this group of believers there in Philippi. He, he knew that they were known for not just being fair-weathered Christians. These were Christians he could count on. They, they served with him and they supported Paul when the gospel was spreading powerfully and even when Paul was in jail. Probably when others deserted him, they kept on trying to be a support to Paul. They were faithful to God in the good times. They were faithful to God in the bad times. And, and they were true partners in Christ. They shared so much in common. They even loved being together. It's one of the things I, I like about Harvest. We, we love to get together. We love to rub elbows. And, and we love to eat together. And we're getting to do that a little bit more. Amen? And uh, I remember when we were... Early on, meeting as a core group years and years ago, one of our men said to me, Preacher, do we have to eat every time we get together? And I said, well, we are Baptists, you know. <laughs> and so um, it's a lot of fun when you get around a table with somebody. John MacArthur wrote these words. He said, a Christian who willingly forsakes fellowship with other believers will inevitably be without genuine spirit-given joy. He said it is impossible to live faithfully or happily apart from fellow believers in Christ. But the believer who regularly is in the company of fellow saints fulfilling the responsibilities that such fellowship requires and provides will just as inevitably be filled with divine joy. To be in the company of those who are joint heirs with Christ, people who love care for, understand, pray for, and with each other who minister and fight the good fight together is to be assured of abundant and abiding joy. That's the kind of joy that Paul was expressing here in regard to the Philippian believers. I mean, they had served together faithfully with him in their church. They had proclaimed the gospel together with Paul and his team. They had prayed together. They had worshiped together. They had defended their faith together. They had abundantly and sacrificially shared their material resources with Paul time and time and time again. And they had been true partners in the gospel for years. When Paul was there and when Paul was not there. So Paul says, I pray for you joyfully. Joyfully. Uh, 20 years we've been together. And as I think about you, I, I try to pray for you and be faithful to do that. I have so much to be thankful for as your pastor. And I rejoice in how we've been able to serve to God, serve God together over all these years. I, I pray for you joyfully. I, I, I pray for you as Paul did, confidently, confidently, that what God started, God will finish. I want you to look with me at Philippians 1.6. This is a very pivotal verse of Scripture. You ought to memorize this. You ought to hang on to this. This is one of those verses that when you're feeling down, you need to get a hold of. You need to let it come back to your mind. You need to read it. Paul says, and I am sure that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus comes back again. I mean, talk, talk about a promise of divine significance for all of us who trust Jesus Christ with our soul and with our eternity. 
Listen, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, a genuine believer, someone who trusts in the Lord, then, then you are eternally kept by God through the person of the Holy Spirit, and nothing can separate you from His redemptive love. That's what God's Word says. Look at what Romans 8.35 said. Paul wrote these words. He said, he asked a question. Can anything, anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Anything? Circle that word. That's a qualitative word. Can anything? He says, does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble in our life, calamity, or if we're being persecuted, or if we're hungry or cold or in danger, or if we're being threatened with death? Verse 36, he says, even the scripture says, for your sakes, we, we are being killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. A lot of Christians were dying in that day. There are a lot of Christians that are dying today. In fact, I think there are more Christians dying today than any other time in the history of the church. A lot of martyrs out there that you never hear about. People that silently live their faith and give their life for the Lord. Look at verse 37. He says, no. Despite all of these things that we might encounter, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. He says in verse 38. He says, and I am convinced that nothing, nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't separate us, and, and living life can't separate us. The angels can't do it, and the demons can't. He said, our fears for today and our worries about tomorrow, and even the powers of hell cannot keep God's love away. He said, whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing Nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Guys, that is exactly what the Apostle Paul believed. I believe that's what Jesus taught him. There's no doubt about what Paul believed about a Christian's eternal security. He believed that the gift of eternal life was what it said. It wasn't just life. It was eternal. Why? Because those two words go together. Eternal life. Life with God that never ends. Life that is forever with the Lord in his kingdom. He believed that if you allow Christ to forgive your sin and to save your soul, that there's absolutely nothing that can change that. Nothing. I don't care what you go through. I don't care what kind of trouble comes into your life. Nothing is going to be able to separate you. Now, we say this a lot of times, but we, do we believe it? How many times have you ever heard the phrase, once saved, always saved? We've heard that. You know, there's some on the outside that will say, well, that's, that's just what you Baptists believe. No, <laughs> that's not just a Baptist distinctive. That is a biblical promise. You may not believe this to be true, but that doesn't make it any less true. Study eternal life in the New Testament, and you're going to find that over 60 times that phrase, life everlasting, eternal life, life that does not end, is used in the New Testament. Now, if he'd only said it once, we could debate what he meant by it. But 60 plus times, I think he did it that much so that you and I know exactly what he means. God's Word is the source of our, our truth, right? Not our opinions. So, how can you and I embrace the assurance of our salvation? Let me give you some thoughts. First of all, I want you to please understand that salvation is received by grace and not your good works. It's received by grace, not good works. No amount nor quality of good deeds will ever get you into heaven. I don't care how many good deeds you can do between now and that time. They're not going to get you into heaven. In fact, the Bible says that your very best deeds are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. Your best. Friends, you were saved by grace alone. Salvation is by grace. Grace is God giving you something you don't deserve. God gives you eternal life, though you don't deserve it. Look at Titus 3, verse 4. I know that goes against everything we you know, I, I remember trying to witness to an Hispanic guy one time, and, and I was trying to help him understand that salvation was free, and he kept shaking his head. And my interpreter that I was talking to him through 
was having trouble getting it across to him that salvation was free. And I, I was thinking it was an interpretation problem. But the problem was, he was a hard worker. He had been taught to work. He had been taught nothing is free. And so to say salvation is free, he's thinking it can't be. Nothing's free. But finally he got it, and it, it was like the light bulb came on. And his face began to glow, and, and he said, I want it. <laughs> I want it. And he got it. <laughs> Praise God. L look at what Paul wrote. He said, but when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, was shown, he saved us because of our merit. <laughs> That's not what it says, does it? <laughs> Y'all are sharp. He saved us because of his mercy. Mercy is one of the twin sisters of the gospel. One is grace, one is mercy. Grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving you what you deserve. It was not because of good deeds that we did to be right with him. He saved us through the washing that made us new people through the Holy Spirit. God poured out richly upon us the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Savior. Notice verse 7. Being made right with God by his grace, we could have the hope of receiving what? The life that never ends. That's eternal life. He says in verse 8, this teaching is true. And I want you to be sure that people understand these things. Friends, if you're saved, you're saved by grace, not by good deeds. Number two, please understand that if you're saved by grace, then you're kept by grace. You're kept by grace. If you didn't have to do anything to earn salvation, then you don't have to do anything to keep salvation. Make sense? logical to me if you're saved by grace then you are kept by grace again the apostle Peter wrote these words not only was Paul teaching this but Peter taught it as well he said for God has reserved a priceless inheritance for his children notice this it is kept in heaven for you kept in heaven for you pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay and God in his mighty power, don't, don't miss this, he will protect you until you receive this salvation because you are trusting him. It will be revealed on the last day for all to see. Wow. Friends, please understand that we are saved by grace. We are also kept by grace. And please understand that Jesus promises us that both he and God have a firm grip on your soul. You ever went out and got on the monkey bars and tried to just hang for a while? You get tired, don't you? And your fingers start cramping. And your armpits feel like they're fixing to come off your shoulders. <laughs> but eventually, and it's, it's harder today because I weigh a little bit more today than I did when I was a kid. I used to get hang forever, but I can't do that very long now. Eventually, you turn loose. But the Bible says that God has a firm grip on our soul. So you're not eternally secure because of your grip on God. No, your salvation is secure because God has a grip on you. Look at what Jesus said. He said, my sheep recognize my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Ooh, <laughs> not just life, but eternal life. And they will never perish. Study that word perish. That's an that's a interesting word. No one will snatch them away from me. You ever thought you had a good grip on something and somebody was able to snatch it away? That doesn't happen with God. Why? Why? It says, for my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. So no one can take them from me. And then in verse 30, I love this. He said, the Father and I are one. So we're working together to hold you. <laughs> what do you fear the most? If I could give you a three-by-five card and a pen and had you write down what you fear the most, I guarantee you, the majority of you would write death. Death. 
You might not if you're young, but when you get older, you fear death because you're closer to it. In our world, everything is dying, right? Everything dies. Nothing lives forever. In fact, the statistics about dying is that one in every one person dies. (laughs) We have a sin nature. And because of our sin nature, relationships can sometimes die. Marriages can fail. Friendships can fall apart. Death seems to be the master of our current world. Death is our enemy. In fact, the Bible says death is our last enemy. But I want you to be encouraged if you're a Christian because Jesus promises us that our good shepherd, he he tells us that not even death can snatch us out of his hands. Absolutely nothing can. In fact, if you go back and you read Psalms 23, verse 4, we find that the, the great shepherd leads us safely through the valley of the shadow of death. You know what that means? That means that death has no grip on God's sheep. That means we're safe in his eternal grip. You don't have to worry about holding on to God because God is holding on to you. And the beautiful thing is he's never, ever, ever, ever going to turn you loose. Never. Now, have, have you ever started a project, project you didn't finish? I know your wives are going. Can I be honest? I want to, it's confession time. I have. <laughs> In fact, Joyce and I had a conversation about that a number of years ago, about all my unfinished projects around the house. I think I have less today than I did have, but I still have some. I still have some. And they blare in my face every time I walk by them. When are you going to give me some attention? When are you going to finish me? In our homes, if you have a home... There's always going to be something that you have to do. I was having that conversation with John Anderson the other day. How there's always something to do. Right, John? Yeah, yeah. But you know what? That's not true for God. Uncommon tasks, unfinished tasks are common problems for us. But, but that's not true with God. The Bible tells us that God always finishes everything that he starts. Go back again. Philippians 1.6. Paul wrote, and I'm sure that God who began the good work, that good work of salvation within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus comes back again. Can can I give you an encouraging thought? Maybe even, I want you to consider this as a fact. A fact, not just a thought, but a fact. You can rest assured based on God's faithfulness that despite life's uncertainties and all the difficulties that we go through no matter how many of us uh, have spiritual defeats along the way you can be assured of this that one day in your life as a christian you are going to reach a point where you are complete and perfect and holy a finished project of the lord hallelujah (laughs) you see when we are saved, God starts that work of grace in our heart, and, and then he finishes that later on. He finishes what he starts. We are all, if we're saved, a spiritual work in progress. We are an active construction site. <laughs> God has promised to work in you throughout your lifetime, and, and he's not going to leave you an unfinished project. I promise you that. Some days we feel like we are. Sometimes we think, Lord, you're just not doing anything in me now. That's not true. There are actually three stages of God's good work of salvation that we go through. Three stages. Remember these. The first stage is the initial miracle of justification. It is a point in time. It is a birthing experience. It is an event. God begins the work of salvation when you make that decision to trust Jesus Christ To make you right with God. When you take him as your Lord and Savior. That is when this begins. Romans 3.23 says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory. A standard of God. He said and yet God in his gracious kindness. Declares us not guilty. That means he justifies us. He has done this through Christ Jesus. Who has freed us by taking away our sin. For God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sin. And to satisfy God's anger against us. We are made right with God. Notice this. When we believe. 
That's the Greek word, pestuo. It means when we trust. When we put our trust in him. When we trust that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us, that is when we're made right with God. That is the moment when God begins to treat you just as if you had never sinned. <laughs> we're human. And, and I don't care how good you think you are. When somebody does you wrong, you're going to have a hard time treating that person like you treated them before they did you wrong. You're going to always think back. The beautiful thing about God is that once we trust him and he makes us right with himself, he didn't think about our sin anymore. He didn't drag the list out. He not only forgives, he forgets. Thank God for grace and mercy. That is when all of our sin, get the scope of this, all the sin you've ever committed in the past, all the sin you committed that day when you put your trust in him, and all the sin that you were yet to commit in the future, all of that sin was forgiven in totality because if he didn't forgive it, he wouldn't give you eternal life. But because he does forgive it, he can give you eternal life. It's not salvation on a yo-yo. <laughs> that is when he gives us the ir irrevocable gift of eternal life. That is when he declares you right in his sight. That is when he adopts you into his eternal family. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Paul says, therefore, since we have been made right, since we have been justified in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Christ Jesus our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand. How do we stand? We stand justified, just as if we never sinned. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. The origin of our salvation is miraculous. It is thrilling. It is glorious. But friends, it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning when you're justified. Notice the second stage. The second stage is the ongoing miracle of sanctification. Sanctification. The writer of Hebrews in 1014 wrote these words. He said, With one sacrifice, Christ made perfect forever those who are being holy, being sanctified. One sacrifice. In that moment, he justified you. That's an event. But in that same vein of things in the process he is sanctifying you this is an ongoing process that that God is fully committed to finishing again I want you to focus on and think about it justification is an event it's when you trust Christ that's not something you back into that's something you decide to do but not only is justification an event sanctification is a process Dan Spencer wrote about that when he said these words he said God is committed to this process even when we're not. I like that. He said even when we dig in our heels and we rebel, He will complete what He began. He says so committed is He to our sanctification that He will discipline us. Imagine that. Discipline us allowing perfecting problems to come into our lives. In other words, God's going to do whatever he has to do to get you where he wants to get you. You can go easy or you can go kicking and screaming, but he's going to get you there. 1 Thessalonians 4 said, Brothers and sisters, we taught you how to live in a way that will please God, and you are living that way. Now we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus to live that way even more. He said, You know that we told you to do this by the authority of the of the Lord Jesus. Verse 3 he said God wants you to be holy. That's a word that means sanctified. When God saves he justifies. And he begins that process of making us holy. He's promised to sanctify us. Now the, the final miracle. Is the promised miracle of glorification. He will justify you. He will sanctify you. And he's promised that he will glorify you. That, that is when God's salvation in you is complete. 
This completion is the final outcome of our salvation, which is the eternal life that he promised us with him in heaven forever and ever. To be glorified is to be taken to heaven. Y'all ready to go be glorified? You know, I, I had this conversation with somebody the other day and said, you know, I, I'm ready to go do that. I just don't want to die. <laughs> I don't want to go through that part. If I can get around that somehow, let's go. To be glorified is to be taken up to heaven. It is to be transformed, made ready for heaven. It is to receive a brand new body fit for heaven in eternity. You know what that means? That means no more sin nature. We're going to leave that booger behind. No more sin, no more dying, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sickness. Praise God, glorification means experiencing the unspeakable joy in the presence of Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and then some more ever. Mm. Whenever and whoever God saves, he always saves completely and eternally. Whom God justifies. God sanctifies, and he promises to glorify. John MacArthur wrote these short words about that. He said, for God, for God to begin salvation in a person's life is an irrevocable guarantee of his completing it. William Hendricks wrote, God is not like men. Amen. Thank you, Lord. God is not like men. Men conduct experiments, but God carries out a plan. God never does anything by halves. He finishes what he starts. He finishes what he starts. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. All honor to God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is by his boundless mercy that God has given us the privilege of being born again. Everybody in this room has been born at least once. Probably most of you have been born twice, spiritually. Some of you need to have that second birth. I pray that you get it. Now we live with a wonderful expectation because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. For God has received a priceless inheritance for his children, and it is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And God, in his mighty power, will protect you. How does he protect us? When he saves your soul, he seals your soul with the Holy Spirit. You are covered in the righteousness of Christ so that when God looks down on you, he no longer sees you in your sin. He sees you covered in the righteousness of his son and he goes, approved. He says in verse 5, and God in his mighty power will protect you until you receive this salvation because you are trusting him. It will be revealed on the last Day for all to see, so be truly glad. He says, there's wonderful joy ahead. Christian, be encouraged. There's joy coming. I promise you, there's joy coming. So I want to pray for you this morning. I want you to bow your heads with me. Let's close with a prayer, a Thanksgiving prayer. Father, I am praying today to you. You're almighty God. You have a plan. You have begin, begun to execute that plan. And you promise, Lord, that what you begin, you finish. I thank you, Lord, that the salvation that you bought and paid for with the life of your son, Jesus, on the cross. I thank you that that eternal life, that salvation is available to anybody, anywhere in the world at any time. Right now, people can be saved. There are some in this room today, Lord, that need to accept you as Lord and Savior. And I pray for their soul. I pray for them. Lord, I pray that you will help them to make that decision and, and have that event experience where they go from being dead to being alive in Christ. So easy, so simple. And it's the only thing that's really free. I pray for that person who needs to be saved. I, I pray, God, for the Christians that are here today that are saved. 
And I pray, God, that you would help them to work out their salvation, which simply means, God, help them now to put to work the grace and mercy in their life that you've given them and, and to help reach others for Christ. God, help us to be the people you've called us to be. Oh, Lord, not only do I pray for the lost and that I pray for the saved, but, God, I pray thanking you. <laughs> It's only because of your grace and mercy that we're even here. You've been so good to us, Lord. You've been so good. You've been good to us as individuals. You've been good to our families. You've been good to our church family. You've blessed us with so much, with peace and joy and fellowship. Being able to come together as a body of believers and have a place to be able to worship you. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us. Lord, as we, we think about each other, help us to pray for each other. As we think about you, help us to give you praise. Help us to be obedient. Thank you, God, for all that you put in our heart to do. Help us to accomplish those great things for you. Lord, help us to be obedient to you today. And by, by being obedient, help us to give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to stand with me. Ronnie and his team lead us in a time of invitation. If there's a decision that God would have you to make this morning, I want you to come do that. Let God receive the glory and praise by your obedience. You come. He who began a good work in you He who began a good work
right, great. You guys are dismissed. Find yourselves a Bible study class.